Jazzcast Pros. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023 and Healthy Illness Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Marie, and we're all about learning how to live our best life with mental health conditions. So I had an opportunity to sit down with Dr. Carlia East, and in this episode, her goal is to help you identify and define what emotional addiction is and what it looks like. Um, we talk about understanding the impact of societal standards on relationships and, and what those expectations mean in our day-to-day lives, as well as describing and talking about gateway emotions and the triggers that lead to this emotional addiction roller coaster. And finally, how to recognize behaviors associated with emotional withdrawal, leading you to identify healthy and unhealthy relationship habits so that you can break the cycle. Just just admit it, girl. You're an addict. Just admit, like, you know, I returned. I made it out and went back. Yes, I did. I married the same man twice, show did. I did that. <laughs> she is an incredible psychotherapist, licensed mental health counselor. She is a psychology professor and author of the book, The Hangover, Overcoming Emotional Addiction, 12 Steps to Emotional Sobriety. So join me and Dr. East as we talk about emotional addiction. Welcome to Healthy Illness Podcast. I am Kelly Marie, your host, and this is the podcast to help you build better relationships while living with mental health conditions. I'm diagnosed and live with borderline personality disorder, major depression, and generalized anxiety. And despite those diagnoses, I've been able to live a full life. I have healthy relationships, a great career, and my mission is to help you do the same. It is a new year, a new you, a time to do all of the things that you want to do starting right now. Now, I'm not big on resolutions. I don't make them. I don't keep them. I believe that any moment is the best moment to make the change that I want to see in my life. And so, listen, I know it's the beginning of the year. If you make resolutions, fantastic. Stick with them. Hold on to them or throw them out the window. Whatever you choose to do. All right, Dr. East, thank you for being here. When I tell you I'm excited, Dr. East, I'm excited. I am too. Thank you so much for allowing me to to come on your platform and uh, share some nuggets and some inspiration with a whole vibe to it. Because that's what we about to do today. (laughs) So we're talking about emotional addiction. Um, Before we dive into that, tell everyone a little bit about you. How did you get to, to this place? Well, like you said, I'm Dr. East. Um, I am the CEO of Smile Psychology and Associates and the executive director of Sapphire Women Pathways. These are both programs that uh, simultaneously provide education and therapy, but also provide resources for for women um, and pathways of education and counseling. And being a woman myself, that's what led me to serve my own, right? Mm -hmm. But What came out of these experiences that I've had in the field is understanding, you know, relationships are very complex things. And particularly when it comes to identifying worth and value um, as it relates to being in a relationship specific. Right. That's the thing. And so being a woman of color out here, you know, hustling, got my grind on love was a thing and has always been. And I fell in love and I got married to the wrong person for all the right reasons and Mm -hmm. coming through that and recognizing that there's survival on the other end was just a piece of it. I returned. I made it out and went back. Yes, I did. I married the same man twice. Show did. I did that. (laughs) And listen, at the time I, I, there were so many reasons why I felt defeated. I felt uh, ruined. I felt tainted. I felt used up because of, you know, a woman with, that was divorced. I felt, you know, just like I wasn't um, worthy. And I realized that there are other women that are feeling like this too. And as I navigated through my situation and learning how to feel more confident through my divorce and learning how to feel good in being single and that my loneliness was a state of mind and not actual a, a present being, that's where the book came from. Because I figured and I knew that women needed help walking through this thing called emotional addiction. They needed help going through these emotional hangovers. That is so real. And 
I always want people to be able to find a nugget or see themselves in the lives of the guests that I bring on to the podcast. And everybody's been there. They might not have made the exact same decision, right? But everyone's been a on that roller coaster. So yes. tell us about emotional addiction. What is it? How does it happen? What does it feel like? So emotional addiction is basically you being exposed to the highs and lows of a relationship, right? So you get into a relationship, there's that initial stage, the honeymoon phase, the butterflies, right? Tingling sensations, everybody's happy. And then there's things that happen in the relationship to kind of test you, right? To see if the relationship should remain. That is, is the addictive part because you enjoy the love and the bliss and the beauty, but then you hate the negatives, but you begin to look forward subconsciously because you know outside of the negative comes something positive again. And so what happens is you'll find that a woman is in a relationship with with someone, whether it be male or female, and they constantly go through these ups and downs in the relationships. The problem is when the downs outweigh the ups, right? That's the problem. And that's when you know there's more of an addiction there than a free will choice, because an addiction will hold you to something or to someone that you don't need to be held to. And that is not holding back on to you. And so as you revolve through that door over and over again, women find themselves going back to the same relationships over and over again. They find themselves um, repeating the prototype. So maybe it's a different person, but it's still the same vibe. Same type of dude, same type of female, you know, same situationship. And they can't just be single. They can't be single because single means something completely different. It means not being validated as a woman. It, be, it means that something's wrong with me, that I'm tainted, that I'm not worthy of certain things. And that's because society has consistently given us definitions of what a woman is and what a woman isn't based upon their markers. And this book is about you recognizing these flawed interpretations, expectations, and ideations of how we should live our lives. And ultimately, you deciding to take back the power and decide where your relationship goes and doesn't go. So you talked about the relationship. And I've been there. And again, I I know most people have, right? That it's a a different relationship, but it's the same person, right? And and then that one doesn't work out and you're in the you're in a new relationship and you look up and it's the same person. You're having the same arguments, right? But they're different people. So how does that happen? How do, how do we end up with the same person over and over again? Well, the problem is that we keep looking for a different person, but we need a different us. Mm. That's the issue. You get what I'm saying? Like we're, yes. we're, we're, we're so busy looking at the external that we don't want, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at the internal. And I get it because remember now we still have this basic stereotypical way of thinking that we're defined. And let me just walk you through that real quick because I think this is important. As a woman, I remember specifically there being certain levels of development that wasn't in a book, but it was society based. Like I wasn't really a woman until I had, you know, until I got my period or my monarch, right? Then I was mm-hmm. like the woman, right? The red coats are coming. Then I wasn't a woman until a man decided that I was worthy of love. Then I wasn't a woman until I got married or I wasn't a woman until I had a kid. There's all these different expectations and rules for women <clears throat> that we often feel like we don't measure up. And so that alone causes us to want to stay and relive situations that we shouldn't be staying in and that we shouldn't be reliving. And so those experiences equal to us just wanting to be connected to someone. And so we don't take the time to be alone because to us being alone is lonely. But when you think about what lonely is, right? Lonely is a feeling. It's a state of mind. It's an emotion. And it can be very all-consuming, but it's a feeling. But when you really look at, are you alone? If you've got a homegirl, a homeboy, a kid or a dog, a parent, if you know what I mean, Mm -hmm. or or a coworker, you're really not alone, but Mm -hmm. you feel lonely. And and the question is, why do you feel lonely? Because you defined yourself as being with somebody else. And what this is about is recognizing that a mate is like your best accessory. It is like the genesis qua, the icing, you know, on top of the cake, the cherry on top. That is what your mate is. They are supposed to be there to accentuate your greatness, not define it, not represent it and not be it, but support 
your greatness and you're there to support them. I love it. Not the cake, not the icing, but the sprinkles. Totally. Like the I cake tell, is delicious. You know, yeah, women are like, did you tell your husband that? I sure as hell did. <laughs> Absolutely. My husband knows that he is my best asset. He knows mm-hmm. that he is my, you know, if we want to put it into categories, my red bottom shoes or my Tiffany bracelet, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm also the same thing for him. I'm his, you know, his watch and his Stacey Adams shoes and his accoutrements and his, you know, ingrained cufflinks. I'm all those things for him. Because he has to be an absolute and complete person, whether I'm in the picture or not. And guess what? So do I. And ultimately, what the woman has to understand is that having someone in your life, that's a choice. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. It's not a requirement. That's a choice. And I think it's a beautiful thing when you get to wake up every day and look at that person and says, you know what? I I chose you today. I chose you. This is who I wanted. I'd much rather be chosen than obligated. I love it. You started talking about the ideals of society and what society says a woman is. How do those standards and, um, you know, societal ideals impact a relationship and like the expectations people bring to to relationships? That's an excellent question. And it actually falls really good um, into one of the chapters of my book, which is called Society is Your Pusher Man. <laughs> mm. And I love it because the book, The Hangover, Overcoming Emotional Addiction, 12 Steps to Emotional Sobriety, is really about looking at yourself in those 12 steps and understanding what do I need to do within these 12 areas to become more emotionally sober, right? And one of the things is we have to start dissecting the stereotypes and the messages that we get from society, particularly the ones that dictate to us what our options are. I'll give you an example. So when we're talking about society as your pusher, man, we're talking about all of the imagery that we get from um, society that teaches us what we should and shouldn't do in relationships. Take yourself to any one of any grocery store and go down the magazine aisle. You'll find probably 20 magazines about how women need to do something to get better, how to get right foot, how to get tight for the summer, how to get your cookie recipe together, how to make them happy, how to keep yourself sexy. There's all these different things that we're constantly being told to do on a regular basis. And then we have the ideologies of what maybe our parents, who they want us to be with, who our girlfriends and guy friends want us to be with. We have Mattel's ideology of fairy tales and happy endings, right? Ultimately, we have a pot of subliminal messages that say, based upon this degree, based upon this color, based upon this level of income, based upon whatever it is, this is the type of person you're supposed to be with. And many of us end up subscribing to that. Or we feel because we've had difficult times in our lives, we don't deserve anything better than what we're being faced with. So we choose to accept where we are. But this is how society plays that role. Open up one of those magazines. What does it tell you? Well, you know what? There's not a lot of single men out there, right? That's what we're constantly reading. There's not a lot of good men out there. There's, but yet I see all these men graduating from Howard, Harvard, you know, owning businesses, all these conferences. I keep seeing these people that they say don't exist. Greetings, everyone. My name is Ra. Yes, I am the host of Father Torch. I would like to take this time to invite you in my discussions on very, very important topics of being a black and brown father in today's society. Being a parent, the other parent, we face trials and tribulations too. We have worries, we have feelings. Here at Father Torch, we promote the advocacy of being the dad you wish you had. Join me at fathertorch.com. If you've been thinking about starting a podcast and you want to include interviews with people across town, Riverside.fm offers unbelievable high quality recordings, regardless of your or your guest internet quality. And it also gives you separate audio and video tracks for each person speaking. And unlike Zoom, you don't have to install anything on your computer and your guests don't either. Head over to Riverside.fm and use promo code JazzyCast to get 60 free minutes of recording and 15% off a membership plan. So that's number one. We're drinking the Kool-Aid. We're allowing society to let us know what's available and what's not. And this is what I tell the woman that reads that. You're available, aren't you? With your awesome behind, with your greatness, with your everything beautiful, you're available, you're here, 
and you ain't jacked up, messed up, your credit messed up, you got 80 kids, you ain't dealing with that. So why does he have to be in that category? Just like you exist, so does he. So where he at? And that's, and that's how we stop, you know what I mean, that cycle. Yeah. Or I'll give you one more that's really important. I remember when my husband and I went on our first date, you know, he opened the car door for me. He, you know, walked with his body on the outside, you know, the curb and my body on the inside of the curb, you know, protective mechanisms. These are things that I paid attention to very closely because that's a that's a person that's going to protect you, take care of you. And looking at that, I've had other girlfriends go on dates where guys did the same things and they were super excited about it, like overly excited, like, oh, my God, girl. He, he he opened the door for me and he pulled out my chair and oh my God. And I'm just like, wasn't that, isn't that the standard? Didn't that used to be what they used to do? Right. You know, being a gentleman, remember that? When they did call and let you know they were running late, when you were supposed to open the car door, or you were supposed to pull out the chair. These are the standards. But we have allowed, you know, society to tell us that these men don't exist or that these are, we're asking for too much. And the truth of it is, is that those are just the average expectations that we should want. That's the care that sh- we should require. And that's the care that we should also give. Right. So I think that understanding how we've dumbed down and lowered our expectations to where we get overly excited over the basic standard. That's the problem. And then we don't hold our mates or potential mates to those standards because of fear. And so do you find then that once you've identified those those happy feelings associated with basic expectations, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When those feelings wear off, where do they come back in again? Like I'm can you help people identify the roller coaster? Like how do you know when you are working to get that high? There are several Mm -hmm. addictive qualities to emotional addiction. So you gotta think about the senses, sight, touch, taste, sound, and smell. All of that goes into relationships, especially for women. The way our brains are fashioned, we tend to think more in color. So we'll have an experience that we'll, we'll remember and take on more of the environment, you know, the weather, the temperature, what happened, what colors, the, all those things influence us. And so our senses are influenced. So, for instance, there have been situations where a woman has been in a relationship with someone, they've loved them to death, and maybe the perfume or cologne that they were wearing was like a staple. And now they're broken up. They think they're fine until they smell that cologne again. Now they find themselves awkwardly, oddly attracted to someone else. But they're like, why do I feel so strongly about this person? Like I haven't even had time to get to know him or her well. Well, it's the association with smell. Brings back those feelings of emotions and and love for that other person. And then it's placed on this new individual because you didn't take time to heal yourself. And so you become addicted Because you get used to these things being in your presence. You get used to the sounds of the feet walking in and out the door or the keys in the door. You get used to the shower being on. And so when there's this stale quietness or when there's no aromas cooking in the kitchen, no footsteps or no banter, it feels vacant. It feels devoid. And so that's where the loneliness comes from. And that's where the urge comes from to want to get that back. And then filling it with someone or things that don't necessarily need to be in that yeah space. we fill it with quick fixes you know our quick fixes are <clears throat> the individuals in our lives that we know we can call real quick and they'll be there mm-hmm. we all got them ladies be real <laughs> <laughs> that in case of emergency <laughs> yeah, yes <that. laughs> we have those quick fixes that we'll call to we have the return to sender right so we'll go back to where we've been before um We'll have the one where we'll just go and try anybody to make us feel loved and and held just for that moment. So we'll sacrifice our standards. But these are all things because the feeling of not being wanted, the feeling of not being loved is scary because who wants to feel that way? And the pressures to be connected and be in a relationship by society fuels that expectation. And so when you've given everything and dedicated so much to your relationship to where, number one, you haven't kept your individuality. And number two, you've allowed that relationship to be the definition of who you are. Then when you no longer have that relationship, you no longer have yourself. That's good. So how do people identify 
the healthy behaviors, the healthy relationship habits? So I think I have to put it in terms of redefining what unhealthy is, because that's the issue. Lots of times people have a definition of unhealthy and it's not broad enough, right? It's too shallow. So most women will say being called out of my name or being hit, right, are abuses that I'm not going to tolerate, right? I'm not going to deal with that. That's an unhealthy behavior. But what about the relationship where you are not allowed or you feel like you can't pray the way you want to pray? Or the relationship where you're financially giving more um, than what's being equally brought to the table. Or relationships where no one's calling you stupid. They're just saying, do you really think you should have said that? Do you think you should dress that way? So certain types of control mannerisms. Those are the the areas where you realize that, you know what, I'm not in in control of this relationship. I've allowed this relationship to control me. The biggest red flag that that I tell women is... I ask them this question. Does your mate make you happy? And, you know, yeah, I'm like, is that their job? Yeah, that's their job. Wrong. It is no one's job to make you happy, but you. Your mate reinforces your happiness. If I rely on my husband to make me happy, guess what that means? If he's not happy, I can't be happy. Right? Or if I'm happy and want to share something and he's not in a good space, then I, I probably shouldn't share what I need to share because I need to match his energy. No, my husband is not responsible for my happiness. I'm responsible for my happiness. And his responsibility is to add to it. And so when you find that you're now looking at that person and defining them to make you happy and defining them to fix your problems and looking for them to solve and fill all those open spaces you are now overly attached and addicted to them. Because guess what? These are all things that you are supposed to be doing for yourself. So in the the few minutes that we have left, I want people to be able to learn more about emotional addiction and the 12 steps. How can people get the book? Where can they find it? And what do you recommend someone's first step is mm-hmm. in breaking this cycle? Well, my books are are located on my website, which is smilepsychology.com. And you can find it underneath the tab, Dr. East Book or Dr. East Speaks. I'm doing some upgrades, so I don't know which one will be showing up there. (laughs) So I wanted to be clear. But, um, you know, the first step, first of all, is recognizing that you're in it. Just, Just admit it, girl. You're an addict. Just admit, like, you know, you keep going, you keep dating the same type of dude or female, you keep going back to the same relationships, you keep repeating the same unhealthy behaviors and patterns. That's the first sign. But the way to get past it is to really start looking at yourself and start determining what type of life do you want to have independent of anybody else, independent of a mate? You know, what does Stacy look like without being in a relationship? What does Kelly look like without being, what do I look like without being in a relationship? Where does that happy lie? Because we're steadily searching for a mate to fulfill the happiness when the truth is the happiness comes from within. And so to me, that's the first step is really being able to look at yourself and identify as a solo woman in this game, what do I need? What are my deal breakers and my compromises? What am I willing to negotiate on and I'm cool with? And then what am I like? "Mm, That's a no for me. Like my nose would be hitting cursing at me in in a profane way like there's you know there's levels to that right because two couples bantering you know and talking Mm -hmm. shit to each other is something right but what you're not gonna do (laughs) is call me out my name right those to me are deal breakers like automatically deal breakers us making the same amount of money not a deal breaker for me not a deal breaker at all because i'm looking at what we're bringing to the table and being equally yoked is not about finances honey It's about what we're both emotionally bringing to the table. And if both of you are equally bringing things to the table, there's going to be a hustle on both sides to meet each other's needs. And so I think really dissecting things and looking at those key places are going to help women to start identifying, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm trying to be. And let me start working on these steps. I'm just over here nodding like, "Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm, (laughs) mm-hmm, mm-hmm, (laughs) mm-hmm. And it's hard. 
do not get it twisted. Like I went through the book comes from my experiences, you know, it comes from, mm-hmm. you know, women in, in general, <clears throat> our experiences. It's hard, especially this holiday season. Oh, my gosh. The holidays make it even worse for women to kind of stand up because there's so many commercials and, you know, expectations to be with family and to be booed up and to be loved and follow right. la, la, la. And I think that added pressure makes us feel like we're lost when the truth of it is we need to spend any season finding us, getting to know us. So that way, when we are blessed with that person to come in our lives, we know exactly who they are. We know exactly who we are. And therefore, that relationship is going to be healthier. I love it. I'm going to have um, the show notes will have the link to your website and to the book. So if you didn't catch it, it will be in the show notes, folks. So you can grab the link there before you go. What's next? Like, what can the people look for in the future from Dr. East? Oh, Dr. East is busy, honey. Well, I am. <laughs> I'm doing a actual um, working on a uh, second release of my book and it will have a workbook to accompany it. So that's nice. going to be pretty awesome because yeah. you're going to have like actual hands on activities. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail into the science of it, you know, so that we understand that piece of it. But in layman's terms, so we can understand. So I've got that going on. I'm super excited about another book that I'll be working on called Acing Anxiety, which will really be something that we all need. Like, how do we deal with the anxiety of work, life, parenting, you know, being a human being, not punching somebody in the face, you know, like all the things. Yes. With all of these things. Yeah. But I'm super excited about um, my wine and wisdom sessions that I'm getting ready to start launching. Yes, you heard me. Wine. And wisdom. See, you see um, my face through the internet. Sessions. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. Tell wine me and more. wisdom sessions will be this opportunity for you to get with me, you know, virtually or face to face, depending on, on where you're located, um, and grab a group of your girlfriends. And I bring, you know, a couple of bottles of wine or, you know, have them shipped to you because it's part of the, the fee. And we sip wine and we talk. And we talk about all the things that you guys are going through when you can submit your questions anonymously and I just give you nuggets and tools and we just have a good old powwow for about 90 minutes. But it's necessary because women need a safe place where they can talk, they need to be relaxed, and they need to feel comfortable about saying the things that we always can't necessarily say in politically correct climates. Wine and wisdom is not politically correct. It's about us getting it in, having some conversations, being relaxed about it, and feeling good about our connections with other women. I am Kelly Marie, your host, and this is the podcast to help you build better relationships while living with mental health conditions. So join me every week right here on your favorite podcasting platform for Healthy Illness Podcast. Be the light. Hey, if you like this episode, check out Getting Real with Bossy, where we chat about what it's like to be a woman business owner. You'll hear interviews with women who are doing what it takes to succeed and the reality of what that looks like. We cover all the topics. Figuring out the rules and regulations, navigating business partnerships, even if that's your spouse, motherhood while running a business, working within your values, and all the ups and downs of being the boss. Are you ready to get real? Pop over to our podcast, Getting Real with Bossy. Fantastic.